Many of you guys have reached out to me over the years asking me to share how I learned how to shift in high positions. And so today I am finally making a video dedicated to this topic. If you like, you can check out the printable guide that I created for you guys, which is free to download and will be linked underneath this video in the description box. So whenever I get asked this question of how did you learn how to play in high positions, um, I always say that it all began with studying pieces like the meditation from Thies and the Schindler's List. By now, you're probably getting the idea that I didn't go about this the conventional way. I took this all-in kind of approach and I think that it won't be to everyone's taste. On that note, I want to caution you to take this information with a grain of salt. I truly don't want to steer you in the wrong direction here and um, you know, especially if you're taking private lessons and paying tuition, I'm sure that your teacher will probably have a personalized plan of action to teach you how to play in high positions. But this video is for you if you're studying independently or maybe you're looking for a different perspective. Um, I want to be as helpful as I can so that you won't have to be as confused as I was when I was just getting started. My mission with this video is to inspire you to get started with intermediate to more advanced music literature and start studying pieces that you really, really love. This is going to be a longer video, as you can probably tell, but I'll break it down into three easy steps. So if you're doing something important right now, you can pause me and come back later when you have the time to watch the entire video. I'd love for this to be a shared learning experience for all of us. So make sure to write down your best tips for shifting in high positions in the comment section below, and I look forward to reading all of them gonna start with an analogy. Let's say you're planning to go on a road trip to visit a friend in a city that you've never been to. So you've decided to take your car and drive to get to your friend's place. But the problem is that you don't have access to a map. I think you'll see why this is going to be real headache trying to get there without a map. So what I'm saying is I want to show you the map first before we can talk about the driving or in this case, the shifting. Because in my opinion, I think that the mechanics of shifting up and down the fingerboard is kind of the easier part. I think that the navigational aspect of the fingerboard can really throw people off. So I wanna get into the hard stuff so that we can make it easier for ourselves. The best way to familiarize yourself with the fingerboard is to map it out from scratch. It's easy to print out a fingerboard um, map from the internet. However, I don't recommend doing this because you, you'll fail to notice the repeating patterns that happens throughout the fingerboard. And there's just something about writing it down on paper that really helps to uncover these patterns. So with your multicolored pens, I want you to start creating your own map and make it as memorable as possible. I want to encourage you to map out the entire fingerboard, not just a slice of it, so that you can really have a bird's eye view of how the notes are organized on the fingerboard. And while you're creating your map, I want you to notice where your natural notes are and your accidentals are located on your fingerboard. So your natural notes are simply notes that are neither flat or sharp, and your accidentals are basically natural notes that's been raised a half step up or lowered a half step down. So if you raise a natural note by half step up, it becomes a sharp. And if you lower it down a half step, then it becomes flattened. After creating your fingerboard map from scratch, we need to label your positions. And positions are simply a numbering system to help us maintain awareness of where we are on the fingerboard. Here's the rule of thumb or shall we call it the rule of index finger? Your index finger basically dictates what position you're in. And I have my trusty violin here to show you. I'm gonna hold it this way so you can see the fingerboard, but basically, oh, I'm kind of wishing I have my finger tapes on so that you can clearly see where the notes are. But bear with me as I try to explain positions. 
Um, so we're going to look at the A string. If we place the first finger on B natural, or we move to the B sharp, or to the B flat, these are all first position. And I want to explain something. Technically, if you're on B flat, which is enharmonically A sharp, that's actually half position. But let's go over to the next note. What comes after B is C. So I think it's about there. Let me see. So C, any type of C, like before, C sharp, C natural, or C flat are all second position. Then moving on to the next note, which is D, I think it's about here. So D sharp, D natural, or D flat, these are all third position. So if you apply that, the rule of the index finger, as you go up the fingerboard, um, you should be able to tell what position you're in. And my shoulder rest just came off. Moving on to the second step of this guide is an emphasis to studying your scales and intervals. The foundation to shifting starts with learning the basic construct of building a major scale, harmonic and melodic minor scales. We're talking whole steps and half steps here. Knowing this helps us to um, start feeling the distances between our fingers. Did you know that there's a formula for each one? We'll quickly go over the formulas together, and this will work with any key signature available for us to play in. A quick reminder of what a scale is. It's basically an organized sequence of notes following an organized sequence of intervals. I'll give you a demo of what this looks like on the violin in just a moment, but first let's go over the formulas together. All major scales are constructed using this sequence whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, or we can say tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. So if you memorize this formula, you'll be set to play any major scale that you encounter. Moving on to harmonic minor scales, we use this sequence, whole, half, whole, whole, half, augmented second, half, or we can say tone, semitone, tone, tone, semitone, tone and a half, semitone. And finally, melodic minor scales are a little bit special because the interval sequencing for ascending scale is different to the descending. So here's the formula for ascending. Whole half, whole, 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 half. And the formula for descending is whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, whole. So now let's go over to the violin so you can clearly see the whole steps and half steps in the key of C. be wondering how this will help you out with your shifting and here's the answer learning about intervals in the context of scales will help you think about your finger spacing patterns in certain key signatures when you move into a different position on the fingerboard the notes under our fingers shuffles and so we need to learn how to adjust our finger spacings depending on what position you're playing in so now that we are on the same page with scales Let's take a look at intervals more deeply. An interval is basically the distance between two notes. In Western music, a number and a quality is assigned to each interval. Again, this is just a labeling system to help us prepare our hand shape and finger spacing in different positions. We have five different qualities to choose from. Perfect, major, minor, augmented, and diminished. 
When we are allocating a number to an interval, what we do is we take two notes and we count from the bottom up to get the correct number. Let's show you the intervals of C major scale. C to D, major second, C to E, major third, C to F, perfect fourth, C to G, perfect fifth, C to A, major sixth, C to B, major seventh, C to C, octave or perfect eighth. Here's what we know. Perfect intervals are fourth, fifth, eighth, and unisons. Anytime you have this number, you can assume that they are perfect interval first. And with numbers two, three, six, and seven, assume that they are major interval first. The reason why I say assume is because we need to take a further step to actually confirm whether they are perfect or major intervals. For example, let's take the key signature C major again and this interval, perfect fifth. So C to G is a perfect fifth interval. What we do is we count from C to G, that's one, two, three, four, five. And because we're in the C major scale and we know that the G in this scale is a natural note, we can be sure that it is in fact a perfect interval. C to G sharp, however, is also a fifth, but the quality is no longer called perfect because it's been raised a half step up. Its new name is going to be augmented fifth. On the other hand, C to G flat is also a fifth interval, but because the G has now been lowered a half step down, it becomes diminished fifth, also known as tritone and augmented fourth. It basically follows this rule. Any perfect interval becomes augmented if it's raised a half step up, and any perfect interval becomes diminished if it's lowered a half step down. Now let's take a look at the non-perfect intervals, two, three, six, and seven. We have a slightly different approach here, and it follows this sequence. You'll notice that there's an extra quality between major and diminished. If we take the notes C to E from C major scale, this is an interval of a major third. However, if the E is raised a half step up, it becomes augmented. But if the E is lowered a half step down, it becomes a minor third interval. And if it's lowered down a half step further, it becomes diminished third. So you see the only difference with this sequence is that there is an extra quality between the major and diminished compared to perfect interval sequence where any perfect interval automatically becomes diminished when you bring it a half step down. We've just gone over a bit of music theory for both scales and intervals. And the point that I would like to emphasize on is that scales and intervals help prepare the hand shape it's not enough to think about shifting from note to note. It's more important to recognize um, what's on the page and how it corresponds to the hand shape and finger spacings whenever we move into different positions. Now that we have a fingerboard map and we know more about scales and intervals, we are ready to drive this thing forward and look at the different types of shifts. So the easy way to look at this is that shifts are nothing but a way to facilitate us moving from one area of the fingerboard to another.
to sum this video up, we looked at mapping out the fingerboard and learning about positions. Second, we looked at scales and intervals and how they help to prepare our fingers and hand shape in various positions. And lastly, we looked at how to differentiate classical, romantic, and combination shifts from one another. All you need to do now is to choose a piece of music that you would like to study and think about applying some of the concepts that we've talked about in this video. The most important prompt I can give you when you're shifting is to know where you are and know where you're going. Think in positions, think about what notes you're covering in the old and new position, and adjust your finger spacings depending on what key signature you're playing in. And my final tip is to let your shifts be audible during practice. It allows you to hear the approach from one position to the next while you're measuring with your hand how far you need to go up. It took a long time for me to, um, to put the dots together and I'm still learning and developing my own technique. So I can assure you, if you don't get this right away, it's absolutely fine. The important thing to remember is to keep working on it and over time, it'll help you develop a really strong mental image of what the notes are on the fingerboard the more that you do it. Hopefully this video was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below and don't forget to check out the printable PDF guide, which will have everything that I talked about in this video. So thanks again for watching and I will see you on my next one. Bye.